agree about what you're saying about justice, but then justice in which language? And how do these two languages then, you know, are they in a sense made to come together and yet held apart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Khalid uh, and Itse, and then we can have a round of, uh, of answers. Uh, thank you for the, your interesting uh, paper, Karima, uh, about Kirito and uh, Barada. Uh, um, the dual and Muthanna um, uh, mean uh, the plural with two persons. Um, that mean uh, all the two, uh, the double, uh, this word. Uh, and it's a figure of Andraji by Khatibi, in Khatibi. Mm -hmm. um, um, in Khatibi, the double, it's uh, the Muthna, the, the, the person, Muth, Muthna, Muthna, double, uh, uh, Duban, two, um, mean a double identity by the Maghrebian uh, 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 subject. Je ne sais pas ce que tu penses de ce double chez Khatibi, cette question du double chez Khatibi par rapport à Boutna et par rapport à la double identité. Yes, and it's there. And actually, my my comment is also very much related to. Uh, Khaled, uh, with regard to Nuthanna, the double, and um, and the sort of the the constant binaries that I perceived that were in, at work there, and uh, for example in Barradas, the the you mentioned that uh, for him uh, exposing oneself to the culture of the other uh, is interesting, uh, but not taking the, 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 the culture of the other as namuzaji, uh, as, as if it was uh, superior. For me, personally, um, hierarchies uh, and power relations um, work mainly through the binaries. And, and so I was wondering if, if, um, if you do find uh, a rupture uh, and uh, a transition from Binaries from conceiving uh, French and and Arabic uh, as you know as essentialist uh, clusters that are uh, mm -hmm. that are completely different to a more diverse multi uh, multilingual multicultural uh, uh, conception and 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 in all of this uh, again in these binaries uh, between like French and the Mashraq or the or the Arab East. Do you find the Maghreb and, and the, you know, the, the multilinguality that is beyond uh, Arabic in, in, in the Maghreb and in Morocco in, in their work in Kiritos uh, and Barbados? Thank you. Should we, uh, Sara, do you want to start and then Karima and then Apurvana? Yeah. Okay. I think my answers would be very quick. Um, so, what is the point of um, um, on uh, why the French couldn't use material that they were producing for French North Africa in Djibouti? Mm. Um, so, again, they try, and uh, the newspaper doesn't prove successful at all. Uh, the French's own interpretation is that this is too complicated for Djibouti uh, elites to understand. So, they say the intellectual level is too high. Of course, I have a different interpretation. That is, that this is material produced for Arabs. Well, in Djibouti, they're mostly targeting Somali and Afari elites, so educated elites, or even just the, the Muslim population that could speak Arabic. So I think that is also the discrepancy in the material, that they are targeting Arabic speakers who are not Arabs uh, in Djibouti. Um, so perhaps uh, th there's something there. Um, and on uh, what was broadcasted on, on the radio, um, we don't have the script. So. Uh, so in general, working on uh, radio history, it's very rare to find the scripts. And so um, I have to do more research, but I, I really doubt that I will find the, the radio scripts. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the interesting questions. So I'll start with the um, um, Kumkum's uh, question about uh, Kilito, and then I think they're all very much interlinked. Um, so Kilito is a very elusive intellectual, as you know very well. Kumkum, he say something, and then. 
uh, it's very provocative and then he goes back to it and so you, you have to read his old stuff to, to try and come up with what he's thinking so I think I think he's not against translation as such um, and he talks a lot about um, it's a bit like a Derridian sense of the monolingualism of the other. So um, I speak Arabic, but in all uh, I speak other languages, but it's in Arabic. So I cannot. So for me, the, his project is that um, I don't have one language. I have many languages, but I speak them. I write them through Arabic. So he actually very much pro translation. In one of his books, um, he talks about the importance of going back to the Arabic Nahda. You know the. 19th century Renaissance, and he said there is a lot of research there to be done on the movement of translation um, from European cultures into Arabic, which caused the first Nahda. And so his entire project is this um, idea of relationship, or the relational, the translational between languages that are very important. And he takes us back, actually, to the medieval Arabic, and he says there was actually first Nahda in Arabic literary tradition, which is the 11th century, the Abbasid time, where these um, Arab authors were translating heavenly from Greek uh, and from Persian. And that's what made Arabic um, a dynamic language because of this encounter with other languages. So for him, translation is fundamental. But in a sense, he's not uh, putting it in that binary uh, way. It's more like a relationship between different cultures and, and, and languages. But he doesn't deny that for him it's all come through his Arabic sensitivity. But then again he said, look, I read in French, but I'm always thinking in Arabic. But I read in Arabic and always French comes and haunts me. So it's quite that relationship or that relational, translational relationship that he has with um, um, a critical thought. And I think it's quite um, fundamental. So I think it's not translation per se. It's the, the idea of translation as a, as a dialogue, as a culture with the other, that is not binary. Um, and going back to Khalid and the um, ATS point, um, so uh, my whole uh, paper was trying to get rid of the binary, the, the idea of the binary. Um, so it's not like uh, uh, Arabic and French, because um, what I was trying to say about Kilito and uh, Barada is that um, um, they, they read uh, French critical thought um, in French, but they also write European thought in French. Uh, so again, the act of translation. Uh, but it wasn't binary. I mean, French critical thought included the various other, you know, Eastern European um, thought that were translated into French. So he says it's not just a binary between Arabic and French. And Arabic itself, again, if you want to think of it uh, more geographically, it included various regions, you know, the Maghreb, the Maghreb. So both authors, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the entire project is based on the idea that we need to get rid of authenticity and colonial alienation. Let's move uh, the, you know, away from these two binaries and find something that can create that kind of relationship um, that it doesn't necessarily bind on, um, based on these two ideas that it's either this or that. And in terms of Arabic um, and, and French as two languages, I don't think um, necessarily, and I think this is really important for both of them, they included other languages. So in Arabic we get, as I was saying with Barada, we get the Amiya, we get the Tmazicht, because which is fundamental <laughs> to the making of the Maghribi, uh, and we get various other languages that were Hebrew, Jewish, Hispanic, that were that came into that language. And with French, we get various other intellectual history. I mean, they, it doesn't exist by itself. The Enlightenment project itself. So, in a sense, I really wanted to move away from the binaries. I was thinking more in terms of that duality, Khalid, the, um, the Mufanna. Um, in a sense that it's, um, and again going back to Etienne's point, is the idea that khatibi uh, l'amour bilang, you know, the idea of uh, falling in love in two languages, is the idea of keeping cultures in view of each other, in the relationship of equality rather than uh, inferiority, superiority. And that's why I was emphasizing the idea of critique. And critique in critique, to be able to keep the political alive, to keep the idea of, um, uh, particularly in the, in the Arab, um, region where, as we know, the repressive, repressive post-colonial state took over intellectuals and their uh, projects. In order to keep dialogue with the political, you have to keep dialogue with the cultures of the other, you know, in a sense. And the cultures of the other opens up that pos possibility of overcoming the repression, the co-optation of the state. So in that sense, it's that uh, keeping in view, which I think is what Varad mm. uh, was saying about Gandhi, the idea of 
keeping the dialogue going rather than closing it up to a nationalist discourse. And in terms of the material um, that you asked about, um, I mean, for, 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 for what I was talking about, it mainly uh, literary texts, like um, books, uh, philosophical texts coming from uh, France, Europe, um, and also from the Mashrek, most importantly, the Nahda books, so the, the major intellectuals that were writing in literary journals, like Al Adab uh, and other journals that were trafficked to Morocco. Um, and read by Arabophone and Fra Francophone readers. But most fascinating, which is related to what Sarah is saying, is the idea of the popular culture, and uh, which is an aspect that I haven't talked about a lot, but the idea of the orality of it, like uh, Radio Saut al Qahira, uh, the voice of Cairo, was extremely powerful in Morocco at the time, in the 1940s, 50s, uh, particularly so in the 50s, and it brought with it the Nasserist um, pan Arabism. And of course, it brought with it the Egyptian culture, popular culture, Abu Kalthoum, Abdul Wahab, you know, and that idea that there is a commonality there of, um, you know, of culture and the way, again, it represented that, that anti-colonial moment, which I think was very powerful. There's also the cinema, which uh, came to, um, to Morocco in the 19, late 40s, 1950s, but not only Egyptian cinema. I was talking to Francesca about that. At that time, um, particularly in Kilutu's books, he talks a lot about um, American culture, so graphic comic books like Kiwi um, and uh, you know uh, other uh, uh, French one and American films, American movies that were so American culture. The Cold War period was also becoming quite powerful in mm. in, in, in that 1950s, 60s Morocco, the uh, you know end of the colonial period, beginning of kind of decolonization. So it's quite diverse. The significant geographies, as Francesca would say, were quite extensive. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I know um, the risks and dangers while talking about Gandhi. <laughs> Gandhi is quite an intriguing uh, figure. And he's not a very consistent person. Mm -hmm. And he, he mm -hmm. says that, please don't demand consistency. <laughs> I'm always in search of uh, truth. And I'm what concerns me is the moment facing me. Mm. So I'm trying to grapple with this moment. And uh, so my earlier position might, might contradict the position I'm taking today. Uh, but that is not very important for Gandhi. Uh, Hind Swaraj in itself is a very, uh, very intriguing text. And I have not as yet reached a final conclusion, or I, or I don't have a final opinion about Hind Swaraj. So, yes, Kumkum, uh, you are right. He does use hyperbole. And uh, so it, it had to be uh, his grandson, Rajmohan Gandhi. And while I was reading Rajmohan Gandhi's uh, biographies of uh, Gandhi or tellings of Gandhi's life, uh, one biography which kept coming to my mind was Amrit Rai's uh, mm. of Prem Chand's life. So it's, uh, he looks at his grandfather uh, smilingly, this text, revered text in Suraj, mm. smilingly, and says that, well, he's using hyperbole. Mm. And uh, Gandhi, Gandhi is a master tactician and master strategist. Mm. And he is dealing uh, with British Empire. So he is using a massive blow is rejecting that modern civilization. But as Rajmohan Gandhi proposes, that please read is as a text which is challenging the violence and tendency to dominate others, which comes with modernity. So Rajmohan proposes, Rajmohan Gandhi, that is not really a challenge to modernity. And Tridip Surhet, while reading in Suraj, proposes that let's not call it anti-modern, Let's call it a modern. Mm. So it's not anti-modern, it's a modern, like a moral. So uh, this is the realm in which Hain Swaraj uh, <coughs> is being located. Uh, but there is no final word as yet. Uh, you were asking about uh, translation into Indian languages. Uh, Gandhi translated 
Indian texts into English or Indian ideas into English for the benefit of the empire or the Europeans. But he also kept translating European ideas or English ideas into Indian languages, Hindustani, Hindi or Gujarati. It was a constant translation. And uh, Gandhi was an incessant later writer. So his volumes, uh, and there are hundred of them, most of them contain his letters written to his friends and companions, his critics, where he is interpreting others, translating others. And his statements, which he delivers uh, in his prayer meetings, invariably. Wherever Gandhi goes, a prayer meeting is held, and Gandhi delivers a sermon. And it's invariably in Hindi or when he's in Gujarat, in Gujarati. So this is constant translation that he keeps doing. And uh, as I tried to uh, say in my paper, that Gandhi was trained in the language of law, and there comes the question that Kumkum was raising, the cognitive part. So, and law uh, says that I am dealing with reason, and so you have to de-emotionalize your language. But Ga what Gandhi does is he translates the language of reason into language of sensibility, and then goes back to law to fight for justice. So without translating it both ways, he cannot achieve justice. This is what he is trying to do. Uh, Ravi Kant, you are right. And I told you that Gandhi is a very intriguing person. Uh, Gandhi used radio. Yes. Please uh, go to his recording in London. Go to his recording when he is on his uh, European tour while returning from London. And please note that all his prayer meetings in 1947 and 48 mm -hmm. were being recorded mm -hmm. and broadcast. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi didn't say that I won't use radio, but he saw to it that all his talks are recorded and broadcast. Mm -hmm. This is what Gandhi is. Gandhi is against train, and Gandhi's colleague, Jewish, mm. Jewish colleague uh, Kalenbach, uh, recalls uh, an incident. He has he has bought a new motor car, and he takes Gandhi to that motor car. And the moment Gandhi sits in the motor car, he very angrily tells him, "Put a match to this motor car, this monster, burn it." And Kalenbach had to put his car in carriage. It lied there for a year. He couldn't use it. But Gandhi used motor car hmm. all over hmm. India. Hmm. He used train. He spoke against train, but he used train. So this is what Gandhi is. And this hmm. is why he keeps uh, troubling us, hmm. what he is doing. But uh, I would use uh, the term that uh, our poet Mukti Bodh had devised. And more than content, because we keep looking about content. Mm. Muktibodh proposes terms some Vedanatmak Disha. This is uh, the direction of your sensibility. So you have to understand the direction of the sensibility which Gandhi is taking, more than the content. And this is what he is uh, uh, doing. Yeah. You uh, asked about the politics of uh, language vis-a-vis -vis Congress. And you are right. But Gandhi always believed, as I have understood him, uh, in the power of persuasion. And he calls him a dictator. He is called a dictator in Congress. But he doesn't dictate. He is against untouchability. But we know it very well that in his first year or initial years, he doesn't advocate Sahabhojan poetry. It comes much later in the life. And uh, his relationship with caste, again, Rajmohan Gandhi other, and other biographers have proposed uh, that he's trying to persuade the so called higher caste because they held power. And so 
he tried to tell them that untouchability is not an integral part of Hinduism. But later, in 30s, early 30s, he started saying, and he published it in bold letters, caste has to go. So when he reached that point uh, in his life, where he felt very confident that now we can challenge the Sanatanists, he said that caste has to go. And I am not advocating or I am not rationalizing or justifying mm -hmm. Varna system or caste system. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just to, uh -huh. You know, um, <coughs> Gandhi wrote somewhere that if somebody is able to show to me that the caste system, no, the untouchability has sanction of the Vedic Vedas, I'll reject the Vedas, mm -hmm. but not accept yes. untouchability. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very much. I think this was a good, uh, very good uh, start. Thank you all the speakers and everybody who asked questions. Uh, so there is lunch, I think, for yeah. the yeah. speakers in the in the other room and participants, and yeah. we uh, in the same place, and we reconvene at uh, quarter to two. Thank you very much. But there is uh, an order from Sanjeev uh -huh. that all of us, before going to lunch, have to assemble here for a group photograph. Group photograph. Because uh -huh. some of us. Uh, would disappear after. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Pierce has organized. laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, Sanjeev asked, uh, we signed our um, we signed our address uh, in the, uh, when we collected the um, the folder. We should put our full address from where we come from, not just YMCA. Yeah. talk about discovering the West, the travelogues and novels in Yamharian literature in the first half of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> it's really a pleasure and an honor to take part in this, uh, this workshop. It's been, uh, this is also very educational to me because it's uh, something that that have to Bring that microphone closer. That we have to do uh, back home also, you know, with, uh, with the young researchers in literature. Uh, not only literature, but also in other... Speak into the mic, please. Yes, I speak. Ah. Is it okay now? Yes, ah, yeah, that's better. better. Uh, Well, I'm sure everybody knows uh, where Ethiopia is, <laughs> and it's on the map. Uh, I would only like to indicate here that the language that I'm talking about, Amharic it is called, is in central Ethiopia, uh, where you have Alto Piai. I got this from uh, an Italian map, Alto Piano. And to the north of uh, Alto Piano on the map, if you can see it, you have uh, Tigrinya speakers, and then there is Eritrea. Uh, so, and uh, then Sorry. a large part of southern and western and eastern Ethiopia uh, is inhabited by the Yoruba. We have about 80 uh, ethnic groups, uh, small and big. And therefore, you know, the notion of multilinguality is something that applies very much for, for Ethiopia. Uh, it's this question of uh, language has always been very conflictual uh, and so on. Uh, Thank <laughs> you.
so I would use uh, the image of the <laughs> Some, I'm sorry, this technology uh, sometimes behave, behaves in bizarre ways. No. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the, the literature situation of the country uh, Ethiopia has uh, a written literature. <coughs> uh, quite, a, quite a few languages have their own uh, uh, written literature. Uh, now, it all started in late antiquity, uh, developing uh, a literature in Ethiopia. And one of the most important decisive events was the conversion of the country into Christianity that led to the translation of uh, the holy book and other religious books from Greek into uh, into Greek, which is the ancient uh, uh, Ethiopian language. <coughs> but uh, and this is an image of uh, uh, a codex of which we are very proud. It is a codex of the Ethiopians, and it's also the codex of the Eritreans. It is a codex that we share because it is. Uh, it was part of this entity of uh, antiquity. This dates to the sixth century. And you can see the, uh, the calligraphy of Amhari, Stegrinya uh, languages here. It has now developed and looks slightly different, but basically it is the same uh, calligraphy. Uh, manuscript in the sixth century of this uh, very proud. <coughs> Uh, Amharic uh, is an old written language. Uh, it, uh, we have the, the earliest written uh, texts are uh, Amharic poems that date to the early 14th century. But when was the first Amharic word written? We are not yet sure about that, but it could go back uh, uh, to early, uh, to late antiquity, uh, perhaps the 8th century. Uh, or even earlier. Uh, I don't want to bother you about that, but in any case, we have written texts that go back uh, to the 14th century. From the 14th to the 16th century, uh, uh, some points, frag far fragmentary materials are found written in Amharic. But the 17th century is very important because uh, bigger uh, texts, book size texts, were started to be produced. And from the 17th century onwards, Amharic has been uh, developing, expanding steadily. Uh, foreign travel in Ethiopia, uh, because we are talking about travelogues, foreign travel in Ethiopia is not uh, something new. It, it has a, 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 an old history. Uh, travel literature is a little different, but foreign travel is very old. We have some documents of uh, pilgrims, pilgrims going out. Uh, into Jerusalem and later into Mecca and Medina, into Egypt, uh, and sometimes into Armenia, uh, all the way north to Armenia and uh, for religious purposes, to Rome, etc., in medieval times. But it was not common to write accounts of your, uh, your travel. Uh, we don't have much by way of uh, uh, testimonies left to us by all these people who traveled. Diplomats traveled, merchants traveled, we have, uh, we have knowledge from other sources, but it was not, uh, it was not usual to write up this uh, experience. Uh, the Ethiopic literature uh, produced in Giz and in uh, Amharic and later in Tigrinya, in Oromo, etc., uh, was mainly religious, uh, and then later it, it becomes with uh, with Ethiopia's transformation to become secular. But it was mainly religious initially, hagiographies, poetry, homilies, theological issues, uh, and so on. With uh, Ethiopia's encounter with the rest of the world in the 19th century on a greater level, uh, very aggressive uh, Europe coming into Africa, and Ethiopia being forced to open uh, its doors wider and wider, traveling uh, also became easier. Uh, 
a lot easier than before. Transportation improved, etc. You all know that very well. So Ethiopians uh, went out as Europeans also came in. The uh, Europeans left behind the travel literature, and uh, I don't have to uh, talk about that. The travel literature that he, the Europeans left behind has been uh, very, uh, very pivotal, very central in the shaping of our own views about our past. Uh, now, however, there is a, a critical evaluation of the travel literature is emerging. In the future, we'll see uh, how much, um, how much um, deciphering is going to be made of this travel literature. But so far, uh, our own views about our past has been very much shaped by, influenced by travel literature, in addition to local documents. Ethiopia's literature, uh, travel literature uh, can be said to have been born uh, at the end of the 19th century in Italy because uh, this man that I mentioned, Fusa Gergis, was taken to Italy and he was living there where he wrote a small account of his travels. And then another man who went to Italy at the end of the 19th century, who lived there for many years, uh, and both of them were assistants to professors in Naples, to, to professors of Amharic and other Ethiopian languages. So the second man, Afor Gabriesus, also wrote uh, some stuff uh, about travel. Uh, so we can say that travel literature uh, in our languages started at the end of the 19th century. The first one, Fasa Gurgis, wrote in Tigrinya, and the second one wrote in Amharic. I will focus on Amharic because that's the language that I know. But the Tigrinya aspect, uh, the Tigrinya part is also very interesting, uh, which it should be taken. Why am I interested in this? Number one, uh, to prepare a bibliography of the travel literature, uh, because we have travelogues, uh, proper accounts of uh, their travels, but we also have novels, novellas, short stories. We also have newspaper pieces. Uh, <coughs> it, it would be good to prepare an annotated bibliography uh, of uh, this literature. Why? Because uh, <coughs> The, these sources would enable us to know how Ethiopians looked at Europe, uh, what they thought of Europe, what they thought of the European way of life, technology, uh, and other things, by examining this thing in greater detail. And there is very, this very interesting approach that uh, this uh, project is developing, and that is this question of dialogue and negotiation when we take in the past, we used to say that Ethiopian writers imitated the novel, imitated the play, imitated this and imitated that. <coughs> but I think this has to be uh, modified. It is a question of it's two sides negotiating. And in order to see this, the beginnings go back, uh, and, and go back to this literature, to the travel literature, where the Ethiopians were trying to sort out how to modify this new medium when they write in their own uh, languages. The second is to start conversations about translation of selected uh, texts without any intention of embarrassing Sarah. We have talked a lot about uh, launching a project of translating some of these texts into English and so that you know they could at least be read by other African uh, intellectuals. We feel that uh, our literature, our uh, uh, our literature, our texts are not known as sufficiently as as it as it's, uh, deserves by other African intellectuals and universities due to the fact that they are not translated. So, in order to put them into the mainstream African uh, literature and for comparative purposes, that is now being uh, advocated by this project, translation work is very important. Now we have quite a number of, uh, a few famous authors uh, who did, uh, who did, uh, who wrote travelogues. The first one uh, is Huru uh, I'll show you his, uh, his image. He has written five books, uh, of which 20, he, over 20 he has published. Uh, novels, he has published novellas, he has published history, uh, historical works, he's published, but also he has published travel uh, books. 
travel books of Rui uh, were already very famous, and uh, uh, a number of people have studied these works. And here with us, there is uh, James, uh, Professor Deloraisi, who has uh, devoted a substantial part of his recent book to Rui's uh, historical works, including the travelogues. And then uh, at my side, uh, at my left, there is Sarah, who has also looked into, into his works. But earlier writers like Cheruli and others have also looked at, at his works. This is Hirui Wallace He was born in 1878. He had a tra uh, an advanced traditional Ethiopian church education. But in Addis, he also got uh, exposure to a bit of modern education, to English language, uh, with while he was uh, in Addis. And uh, it was through missionaries that he was able to get his education. So, Basically, he was a traditionally educated Ethiopian, as we say, who went through the Ethiopian school system and very extremely well-educated man, uh, who did not really have uh, uh, European education, in the true sense of the word. Uh, this is his picture in one of his travels. He has been to Europe many times, and his last major travel was to Japan. And here we see him in Japan, uh, together with his uh, Ethiopian uh, assistants and colleagues, and at the back there are the, the Japanese horses, and the, she has very kindly, uh, she's, dressed, she's dressed up as a Japanese woman, very kindly in Ethiopian dress. Uh, and they are, they are dressed in Japanese things. Recently, uh, a new manuscript uh, of Rui was published. It was written in 1911, so it, it becomes uh, the oldest book length big uh, size book to be written, and this was in 1911. His other books are in the 1920s and the 1930s, but this one is in the, in the 1911, and uh, I find it very interesting for many reasons. This is the, the recent book that uh, was not published for a long time. It was in the form of a manuscript, which one of our colleagues now edited and published uh, a, a year ago. So uh, it's a new book. Uh, it was received with a lot of excitement in Addis Ababa. Uh, it was a subject of a lot of discussion over the media, radio, uh, uh, radio, television, so in Addis Ababa. Uh, this is a trip that this delegation made to London uh, to attend uh, the coronation of uh, an English king. And the man uh, in the center uh, uh, was the leader of the delegation, and the others uh, uh, were, his, uh, were members of his delegation. The author is not in this picture, unfortunately. Uh, he should have been in this picture, but Ethiopian protocol demanded that he should not be in this picture. His status did not allow him to be in this picture. These are very highly placed, these were very highly placed nobles. Heru himself was employed at the time, he was uh, an employee of the Ministry of uh, Health, but uh, low level employee. Uh, <coughs> these were high level lords or ranked uh, lords, that's why they, they did not put him in. That's our understanding of the fact that he's left out. Uh, because it was a rigidly hier hierarchical, uh, protocol-oriented society at the time. Uh, they went to, for this uh, coronation ceremony, and then they went to, uh, to France. They proceeded to Italy, so they visited three countries. Uh, and this book describes their experience uh, from Addis Ababa as they set out. Uh, they took the boat, the steamer, from uh, the Somali coast, from uh, uh, Djibouti, and then they went off to uh, to uh, Europe, to England, and he describes one after another the experience that he had. Uh, one of the interesting things he describes is you know, on the boat, on the steamer, they met a uh, Chinese uh, passenger who discusses with them the danger of uh, these Europeans making them friends. Uh, making the Europeans friends, you know. He said, ultimately, the Europeans would come to conquer you. They would establish their hegemony. 
And the Ethiopians listened very well with their own experience of uh, several uh, battles, wars with the, with, the French, with the Italians, and then uh, all kinds of problems with the British, uh, with the Egyptians. This was something that they liked to listen to. And uh, they picked up uh, things like that. Uh, so from the very beginning up until their travel comes to an end, they had uh, very many uh, experiences and quite, some of, quite a few of these are recorded in this travel account. Now, uh, Hrui has published five uh, books of travels, uh, uh, starting from 1911 to 1932, and eventually he had to leave the country together with the emperor in 1935 when Ethiopia was invaded. He went to London. He, uh, he got a position uh, in SOAS, where he was an assistant uh, for a professor who was teaching uh, Ethiopian languages, and he died unfortunately, in, in London. Uh, his style, uh, because of his education and background, his style was a traditional style of writing chronicles. So he was like a, a chronicler. He was taken into this uh, delegation because of his well-known writing skills. And therefore, he joined all of this because he was expected to uh, not down uh, and then write, write that up, you know, uh, very, very much a chronicle thing. And when you read Ethiopian chronicles from the 14th century to the 20th century, the travels of the kings gets a lot of space. Their movements from place to place is written uh, in great detail and it gets a lot of space. So this falls within that uh, uh, tradition. Uh, but then there are some things, interesting things that he adds as, as they move on, uh, in spite of the fact that it's more like a log book, we get a lot of additional pieces that, uh, that uh, gives us insight about their experience. For instance, uh, experiences with racism, uh, experience in Italy where the Italians hated the Ethiopians because their, their defeat in Ethiopia at the end of the 19th century was still fresh in the memory of many Italians to see this uh, Ethiopians coming to visit them uh, after that kind of humiliating defeat uh, was uh, was something Italians couldn't, couldn't swallow. So it was terrible. They behaved very badly. Another traveling traveler writer is Taklaharet, who wrote uh, a major autobiography. In this the, this conception of geography becomes very important. He was sent to Russia for high advanced education, he then, he then he came back, then he went to France for another advanced education. All of this is described at length uh, in this book. Uh, it was at the end of the 19th century and in early 20th century that these travels are uh, accounted. And this man was our first playwright. Uh, so he had, he tried his hand at playwriting and at autobiography and then uh, at other things. Now. Uh, we feel that it's good to compare this travel literature with the travel literature in other parts, from other parts of Africa. I have selected only two. One is uh, a Japanese travel writer who was very famous in the history of Japan, very influential, Fukuzawa Yukichi, and the other, here is this man. And the other man is Rifa al Tatawi of Egypt, uh, who also wrote his travel accounts. Uh, it will be very interesting to to compare travel accounts and see how much information, how much they they show us about the views the Africans and the, and the Japanese had regarding this powerful force that all of them stated very clearly that Europe was very powerful, that civilization was good, the technologies they admired, but then there were many things they didn't like, they hated. You know? Uh, then after that, during the Italian occupation, uh, the war, the occupation, many people moved out. The exile, some of the exiles wrote. Prisoners of war taken to Italy wrote some of their experiences. Prisoners in concentration camps also wrote their experiences. Post-Italian travel literature into the 1950s. Many people went abroad for study. That's quite understandable. It's not anything special. They described their experiences. Now we, are, we have a famous case, I'll come to that. Uh, uh, 
And this is also interesting. They put their experiences into novels, into poetry, and sometimes into plays. So it went into art also, in a more dramatic way. This man uh, uh, is very interesting because he has some two useful poems about his experience in India. One is about Mumbai, which in those days was Bombay. Another was about about uh, about India as a whole. Uh, but he also wrote a long po poem about an Ethiopian lord going to uh, America, a satirical poem, where this lord was subjected to racism. The lord simply could not understand how he, a well-born Ethiopian, belonging to such a glorious dynasty, going back to the days of Solomon and Sheba, could be treated as a slave by a white man. You know, it's unbelievable. He just could not understand that. So this poem is very popular even today. Uh, satirical uh, criticism of Ethiopian nobility who found it unable to understand that they were uh, subjects uh, of uh, racism and so on, like other blacks, uh, which the Ethiopians refused to recognize, you know, to accept. Uh, finally, this woman, uh, you know, she was the first deputy speaker of the house in Ethiopia's history, uh, one of the earliest to go abroad on her own for education, uh, a patriot. Here she is when she was captured by Italians. The man you see uh, on her right is an Italian soldier at the time of her capture. Uh, this one is also on her, on her left, is an uh, when, when she was taken uh, prisoner. She was born, uh, she was a well-born woman, uh, very well educated. She wrote a number of uh, uh, small books. And in some, to some of these books, her experiences uh, abroad uh, are uh, included. Uh, after saying this, my time is up. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Francesca and have a good reason for this, because I would like to take up some of these issues uh, back home to my younger colleagues. Uh, I think they would be much better suited uh, to follow this up and uh, be part of this international conversation. Uh, I would like to thank again Sarah, who introduced me to all this. We, we, we met in Addis, and then she has introduced me. She was the first to introduce me to all this. Uh, it's indeed a wonderful, uh, uh, I am really grateful that you introduced me, because, you know, these ideas have to spread. And finally, uh, thank you for your patience uh, in listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll have the second presentation and the Q&A at the end. Um, so let me introduce the second speaker. Where is she? Okay, 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 perfect. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, Charu Singh, who's going to talk about London Yatra, a woman's travelogue from the 19th century. Can you tell her that she has 20 minutes? So I'm going to <laughs> introduce my paper as a started reading. Travel of Three Ladies, London Yatra and Other Travelogues. It was by the fall of 19th century when Rabindranath Tagore's Europe Pravashir Patra were published. In 1963, Nawab Sikandar Begum, a Muslim woman and hereditary ruler of princely states of Bhopal in colonial India, traveled to Makkah with a retinue of thousand people. On returning, she wrote an account of her journey. Perhaps it was not before her account was published, people in India heard of women's travel of. For the first time, after this, for several decades, the Multilingual Society of India was going to come across various women's travelogues, and they were in no connection to pilgrimages. In this paper, we are going to discuss three travelogues published in Hindi, Bangla, and Urdu. The purpose behind discussing these works together is to acquaint ourselves with the vivacity of experiences of three, three different women who spoke three different languages from their travelogues, we not only get to see the, the counter-narrative of Europe from the perspective of colonial women, but it also aims at analyzing how the stereotyped colonial women viewed themselves and Europe. Possibly during this study, we will be able to have a relative scrutiny of these works. England, Bengamela. 
In 1885, the wife of Devendranath Das, a lecturer at Cambridge, published an account of her travel and stay of three years in England under the name of a Bengali lady in England in Bangla, which was considered to be the first woman travelogue of Bangla Bhasha, understandably because of her bold stand and critic takeover the British rule in India, Krishna Bhavani Das published it under, under the name of a Bengali lady instead of revealing her identity. Second is London Yatra. London Yatra was published by Oriental Press of Lahore in 1888. It was written by Srimati Hardevi, doctor of Rai Bahadur Kanhayalal, a famous engineer, historian, and poet. She went for teacher's training course in England along with her brother Sevaram, who was going to study law, his wife, and their 10 year old daughter. When her baby was 14 years old, she got married and shortly became a widow. With, with names like a young Hindu widow, a Hindu warrior, etc., she began writing anonymously about the struggles and constraints imposed on Hindu widows in both Hindi and English languages. Apparently, the bitter true language of these texts prevented her from mentioning her name in her early writings. London Yatra is perhaps her first known work published with her name. During a London stay, her Devi wrote her travelogue in two parts, the first of which was London Yatra, 1888, and its study is included here. The third is Jamana Yatasil. Two decades from London Yatra of her Devi, Atiyah Fazi also went to England for teacher's training. It was the time of 1906. Atiya was born in Istanbul and grew up in Bombay. She was related to a well-known Tayyabji clan of Bombay and Gujarat, the few of Suleimani Bohra community of Muslims. Atiya was not the first in her family to go to Europe for studies. Many women of her family were already present there. Atiya used to write letters to her sisters, which were regularly published in the famous Urdu women's journal, Tazib un under the name of Zamana i Tehsil during 1906-7. Keeping in the mind the circumstances of 19th century, these travelogues express and explain the lifetime experience, which were inclusive of the expression towards female liberation of these three women, as Krishna Bhavani writes, since many days I have nurtured a secret hope in my heart to meet my dear freedom, I shall go to the country where she resides. I shall go to that place where the goddess of freedom resides in every home. She is happy and all live in peace. O oh, mother, there is no chain of bondage around the necks of human beings there. The sons of England enjoy happiness, which is the gift of freedom. I ardently wish to know why England, which is so respected, civilized, and well-educated, is deluded to oppress India and make her miserable. Hardevi, Ati, where Hardevi was the, from the famous family of Badruddin Tayyabji, who was strongly in favor of female education and female liberation. She never had to face the stringent Parda law, where is Krishna Bhavani, a woman who followed Ghungata, whose modern husband took her along with West, in a western attire straight from Havra station. While Krishna Bhavani left for England in hat and gown to embrace the freedom and left behind her daughter, the 10-year-old was sold to orthodox Hindu tradition and submitted to matrimony by her grandparents. The woman who wrote so many pages on female liberty had no say in the regulation of her own family. At the same time, her Devi was an educated child widow from a well-known family of Northwest provinces, settled in Lahore. At a very young age, she came in touch with the famous reform with the famous reformers of her time, including Kanaiya Lal Lakdari, E. M. Enning, and Swami Shubhyan Chand, etc., and adopted Brahmo Samaj with her brother. As if it was not enough for a widow to have a sea voyage and a study abroad, shedding all the orthodox imposters, she even married to the utter shock of Kayastha community. Consequently, she and her Ari Samaji barrister husband were boycotted by community, but this could not detain her. She had strong connections with capable revolutionaries, Congress, and National Social Conferences. Her vehement reproach of Congress members in the light of female education and liberty was appraised in the year, yearly report of National Social Conferences following. The speeches of Lal, Lala Sundardas, Suri Hansraj, Shivdayal, Ruchi Ram, Lajpat Rai, Bishan Narayan Razdan, Divan Narendra Nath, and Munshi Ram were excellent. But Srimati Hardevi, the gifted wife of Mr. Roshan Lal, excelled all. She was interested with the first resolution on female education, and she put them into shame for having neglected the education of women. 
We had never expect, expected that she would be able to speak so admirably. Roshan Lal is a good speaker. And as president of the reception committee, he performed his part well. But we must gloriously confess that he was overshadowed by the better, by the better off. Our congratulations are to the Nobel Peer. Many years from her journey, Atiya challenged Mohammedan educational conferences at the exclusion of women by gate crashing the Jubilee meeting in 1925 to climb up on the dais, unveiled, deliver a powerful speech in favor of equal rights for women. Even though Atiya, Krishna Bhavani, and Har Devi, feeling Hindustani in the middle of a European land, they could not match their picture of Hindustan, they conceived in their mind. Atiya Fazi, who was a friend of Iqbal, later came in touch with Muslim League and went to Pakistan as soon as Pakistan was formed. For her, the history of India began from victories of Mahmud Vaznavi. While for Krishna Bhavani, the history of last 700 years was history of servitude and Muslim rulers of this era were foreign invaders. In this regard, her Devi's travelogue is most interesting. Sorry. Her image of India seems to be deeply influenced by Orientalist thoughts prevalent during that time. Neither did she consider India to be in verse of Europe, nor claim Muslims or even Christians to be foreigners. Rather, for her, India and the rest of the world share a common past. Possibly for this reason, she preferred visiting Pompeii to Venice and Paris. The manner in which she portrayed Pompeii clearly shows how influenced she was from the Orientalist thoughts. Quote, One more thing which not only shows a close connection between the Aryans and the Romans, but also proof that these two communities were the same is the deity worship and sacrifices. The temples are still standing torched with the deities inside it amidst those. There, are, there is an enormous temple of goddess Venus along with a pyre of worship. For worship, a huge table is kept for animal sacrifice where the bodies of dead buffaloes tied in ropes, worship, utilities and corpses of 1300 men, women and children were found. Goddess Venus is said to have incarnated from sea and was fond of lotus. Mother of beauty, queen of love, epitome of kindness, and the source of happiness are considered to be her varied forms. In our understanding, the same goddess is worshipped as goddess Lakshmi in our country till date. Kamal Priya and Sindhu Tanya are her two names. From such three ladies, these were the, these were the three women. Uh, from th such three Indias, these were the three women who shared their experiences with their sisters. What did these women see of the world and of themselves while watching their reflections in European glass? Did Europe surprise them? Quoting Ashish Nandi, In many sections of colonial India, particularly the Bhadralok of Kolkata, when it, come, when it came to Europe, you were expected to surprise and shock your compatriots and yourself in a surprising way. Europe made sense as India's antonym, and to a sizable section of India's urban educated middle class, India too had begun to make sense as antonym of Europe. To some extent, the conclusions which were drawn by Ashish Nandi correspond with the travelogues of Hardevi. Certainly, while leaving from Bombay, she had some information regarding Europe. It is definitely not hard to find out sources of these information, the influence of Brahma Samaj, reformist friends, a highly educated father, and her own education own education from British as a missionary collectively enabled her to have a broad insight of Europe. It could not be attributed to just colonial stance. It can be said that Orientalist scholars have pictured India in the orthodox field. This obviously was a paradox of materialistic and industrialist, industrialized West. At the same time, it is also true that emerging educated youth, which was inclusive of Hardevi, was highly self-conscious and alert against colonial derivations. This generation of female travelers didn't see East and West in a paradox. Instead of this, these women tried to see England in a different light from the other Western nations. Mrs. Hardevi and Krishna Bhavani Das enlisted their travelogues. In their travelogues, England, like the rest of the Europe, is different and uncultured. The people there are selfish, mean, and proud. On the contrary, people of other European countries are more civilized, simple, and more like Indians. The women in Europe, European countries, for instance, Germany and Italy, are akin to Indian women in terms of Mehman Nawazi and generosity. See the context of three travelogues given below. Krishn Bhavani wrote about Italy. Women of this country are mostly good looking like us. They have, they have, white, they have white face 
black hair and black eyes. Their complexion is quite fair, but not pale. They appear to be very humble and artless. And I felt addressing them as Didi. But unfortunately, we could not talk to them, as we could not speak Italian. Even now, one can find certain traces which prove that Italians and Indians have a lot in common. Even now, the poor women here use scarves instead of hats, similar to our gumta. And many women were wore hangara and shirt, like those worn by the Western women of Northwestern India. Similarly, her Devi writes, Rising very early next morning, I saw beauty of gardens and forests of Italy. The station stationed between were also amazingly crowded. Men and women all had the expression of kindness and mercy on their faces. Whosoever came to sit in our compartment impressed me by their goodwill and beauty of soul. They had a soft corner for foreigners, unlike Britishers. They were not rude and rough to people, people and could never eat without attending to a weeping kid if there is one such kid in front of them. Italians are genuinely sweet and social. Even Atiyah felt the same way. <laughs> Professor's wife, she was writing about Germany. Professor's wife took me to, with, her, with her to a German household. In the women, the women here are greatly similar to Indian women, especially in housekeeping. That is, <laughs> busy with the household and taking care of something that is found less in England. It's possible to live here. There is, there is artificiality and silliness mixed in the air of England. And here, humble sincerity and a high degree of education. That is manifest in um, almost everywhere. So we cannot see in these travelogues the contradictory and stereotyped image of East as antonym to West as suggested by Ashish Nandi. Instead, we see a new conventional image of Eng England versus the rest of the world. It did not just happen in vain, rather it had a thought behind it. Hardevi writes, quote, Now here is a little description of British cruelty. <laughs> it does not talk about all the Britishers in general, but only those uncouth and mean people, in particular, who came to India and dishonored and exploited the privileges which they got here, driven by the insanity of newly acquired wealth, they started tormenting humans like animals. Krishna Bhavani Das expresses even more openly on these colonial relations. Quote, they do not suffer from any pangs of guilt even while extorting money from other countries by unfair means. They explore every, every possible opportunity of earning from India and other countries. They caused immense bloodshed and, and incurred heavy expenses in order to introduce opium forcefully into China. Such is the stronghold of Mammon in England that even after poisoning the Chinese in this way for their selfish profiteering, the British did not suffer from any guilt consciousness. In India, China, Germany, France and other countries, knowledge and wisdom are worshipped more than money. But in England, money is supreme. Here, here we can see that not only the colonial intellectual, intellectuals captured East in an orthodox light, but East also captured its imperialist nation into a conventional light. The women of London, the women on, on London expedition were not only seeing Europe alone, while passing through the rail tracks, roads and seas, they were exploring their own beings. Since both Hardevi and Krishnamani came out of Parda, they shared the habit of comparison from beginning till end. They were not happy and convinced with their own freedom and were seen to be constantly complaining, comparing their they are tamed Indian sisters with free European women. Throughout their travelogues, from a, win from a window of a hotel in Switzerland, her Devi is standing and looking down at the market. She writes, For how long will we speak of these lucky women spending their lives in the luxury of independence? Seeing them, one cannot dispose the irres irresistible image of Indian sisters, who by birth are bound to the chains of servitude and the pangs noting our consciousness therefrom. It is then when I question our great Lord, O Jagdish, if you have created us all equal and the same things in this world, then why should our destinies be different? What harm did the feeble Indian, wo Indian women ever cause that you separated autonomy entirely from their fates? fates? Alas, from how long will they live this en enslaved life? When and what age will they attain resurrection? When will they live like a human in a human form? Similar thoughts emerged in the mind of Krishna Bhavini Das. Quote, Come sisters, let us break free of our prisons. 
To make our dear brothers realize that they must free us all, we the women of Bengal, from the chains tied to our feet. Come and see the freedom enjoyed by Germans, French and British women. They are spirited and cheerful and have no reason to shed humiliating tears. See there, the men neither neglect their women, considering them one worthless, nor do they imprison the women like animals in, the, in their inner quarters. Sisters, I have earned my freedom, but find no happiness without you. Your pale faces and tearful eyes are always there before me. If you could experience this freedom once in your life of bondage, you would never wish to remain imprisoned in your house to keep your faces hidden behind veils. Atiya, on the other hand, compared things differently. Because of the privilege Atiya had, since she belonged to westernized and English educated family of Tayyabji, she could not relate to real life of her Tehzibi sisters. This could be the very reason why we see no approach of suppression of Indian women in her writings. Actually, these three elite ladies saw Europe through, their, through the prism of their own lives, but they are rarely ever mixed up with people outside aristocracy. So the difficulties of common, common Indian women didn't, didn't exist for her. The central theme of her Zamana i Tafsil is focused on the domestic interiors, descriptions of home that she visited, grand public gatherings, and prestigious social engagements and dresses. Quote, Cur uh, dresses. Curiously dress, as touched upon here, was a matter to which Atiya returned again and again in the course of her narrative, suggesting that dress like food was something of a preoccupation for the London event. It could be that, unhappy with her own unconventional beauty, she fixated on the physical appearance, I'm not saying this, that one. She fixated on, fixated on the physical appearance of others. Whatever the reason, it was only the delicate and tasteful clothes of the ladies that, in her view, made the view pleasing. On a visit to Richmond in June 1907, instead she provided detailed descriptions of particularly attractive outfits and combinations of jewelry, presumably for the benefit of her Tahzibi sisters, but with the effect that many of the women that she met seem nearly to walk off the page. Worth nothing is that these commendations were directed as often English women as Indian friends and acquaintances. The former category included her fellow students at Maria Great Training College on the occasion of winter party, at which they used only flowers and ribbons to decorate their clothes and hair. Their clothes were, she writes, their clothes were tasteful and beautiful. But if it were to be seen all together, what was there? Nothing. Shaban Lambert Hurley writes, the class distinction drawn by Atiya were also apparent in her references to subalterns outside the domestic environment. As she observed after a stroll in one of the London's park, quote, in the city everyone dresses in a way that no one cannot tell a person of ranks from one of the lower class, whether this egalitarianism was in her view to be admired or not is not entirely clear, but her passing references to working people do indicate as how she understood their respective relationships. While retains blue collar workers, while Britain's blue collar worker, workers may have belonged to the race that ruled India, her own elite status in Bombay's social hierarchy gave her confidence that seemed to tinge her admiration for their industriousness with condensation. Decision. It is interesting to read about Edwardian aristocratic women in the writings of an Indian woman. It is creased between the desire of praising the British women and identifying with them at the same time. Atiya did not like the surprise show by, shown by the British photographer on her modest and tasteful dress up. She offendedly writes, she offendedly writes the quote, the lady editor and a woman and a woman photographer artist from the ladies. Pictorial saw me, wrote a memorandum and fixed a date for the picture. I have to go on Saturday. They were both amazed by artistry and suitability of my clothes. Until now, they had ungainly thoughts regarding Indians. If they met an Indian who does not meet their fixed views, they become totally flabbergasted. I don't know at which level they place Indians in their minds that everything surprised them. At another place, Atiha writes, the countess introduced me to many ladies. Later, we went to garden where music was playing under the trees and a crowd was present, several dresses were rare. But one, in, one duchess wore a body that had hundred roses of raised Brussels lace. In middle of there appeared to be a long pearl. 
what is this teacher? Oh, fool. Oh. The way these people used to laugh, in, laugh at Indians, wearing a lot of jewelry. Now they wear so much more. How they drone themselves in jewelry is worth seeing. I'm reading the conclusion. These three women were the representatives of the multilingual society of colonial India. Krishna Bhavani was well versed in Bangla and Hindustani languages and was a learner of English language. Her Devi took birth in a Braj Bhasha speaking caste family of Agra and was brought up in Lahore, Lahore based Punjabi community. Being the daughter of Kanaya Lal, a well known poet of Urdu and Persian, she used to write in Urdu. Her education, which she received by Yurzanana missionary, introduced her to English as well. Possibly it was the Ari Samaji influence in Punjab that inspired her to write in Hindi, like many other Hindu women of her time. Most of the Muslim elite women embraced Urdu as their language. Shabam numbered her and Sunil Sharma tells how the Yabji family abandoned their mother tongue. Gujarati in their family and instead accepted Urdu as their language. If ever a girl in, their, in the family ever used a Gujarati word while speaking in Urdu, she was fined. Dodia was well versed in English as well as Arabian, Arabic, Persian and Gujarati. Her efforts were always directed at writing better in Urdu. To this end, she, ex she exchanged several letters with Maulana Shibli Nomani. An extract has been taken from Shibli's letter to Adia. Quote, you must... You, you, I'm leaving this. The language used by these women to express themselves was an effort at the creation of self-image. The language, Hindi, Urdu and Bangla, which they chose, represent their perspective of the world as well as their social background. Because to much extent the political significance of these languages was established by them, these travelogues actually are the conversations of these writers with their community, pretending to interpret their London Yatra from the perspective of their Indian sisters. In these travelogues, the curiosities have merged with their curiosities have merged with the curiosities of their readers. The way they saw English habits regarding food conduct and traditions is entirely Indian. The surprise at open companionship of European men and women and larger gatherings of women than men in markets and commending the bravery of Britishers was already infamed amidst, amidst Indians. Having repeated these ideas in their writings, they created a bond with their readers and made their writings even more compelling. The nativeness and the familiarity of these travelogues was the actual treat for their readers. Without this, it would have been an unreliable account for both the parties. Thank you. So thank you very much. It was a very rich and powerful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and um, now we'll move on to the third speaker of the panel, Udaya Kumar from JNU, who's going to talk yeah, about literary yeah. neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first, I have clarifications. And the first thing is, um, you know, initially we had thought of uh, having my paper in a different session, mm, so it's yes. a slightly, uh, on a slightly different theme. Uh, Rusinka Chaudhary and I were meant to be on the same panel, and, uh, but it was humanly impossible to be in the same space at the same time, so we decided to change that. So some of, while, <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then uh, s the second uh, uh, clarification is about the title. Uh, since uh, when Francesca sent the draft programs, I was busy checking the date and the time. I didn't really look at the title of my paper. <laughs> so the, 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 the title actually has uh, uh, a colon and something more after the scriptic literary neighborhoods. Uh, not that what is there clarifies anything any further. Uh, this, the, the part after that is the proximate and the distant in Malayalam poetry. Yeah? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to speak about is, uh, thi this actually really comes out of some conversations that uh, uh, Francesca, Ravikant, Vasutha, Vaidik and I had some uh, probably a year ago, year and a half ago, about conceptions of the world in world literature and uh, how uh, they, they, they kind of resonate with practices in locations like our own. And uh, when I thought about it in the context of uh, Malayalam writing, you know, that is, Malayalam is the language spoken in Kerala state, which is in the southwest part of India. Uh, and my work has, for some years, has been primarily on Malayalam writing. 
Uh, so in the context of Malayalam writing, the question of the world in a larger sense is more easily posed in the case of prose fiction. Like in the 19th century, we know that there is the coming in of um, uh, new forms, like for example, the novel, autobiography, uh, 18th century, you begin to get travel writing, you know. Uh, but I was interested in looking at poetry because there things are more difficult, you know, the, the, uh, the durability of tradition or durability of uh, what, what uh, the concept note calls the literary habitus is actually much stronger. Uh, and there it would be interesting, I thought, to ask the question, what kind of conceptions of the world come up? And what kind of conceptions of space come up? There I felt that uh, more than uh, an, an idea, an, a rather abstract idea like the world, uh, more spatial categories which are more closely linked to practice of exchange, interaction, etc., like neighborhood would make much, much better sense. And here, of course, with neighborhood, you know, you, you certainly have a sense of there being strangers there. Everybody is not entirely familiar. The neighborhood is not the home. But at the same time, you also have a certain sense of intimacy, certain uh, rights of intervention, you know, uh, probably certain rights of expressing hostility, you know, things of that kind. But I was also struck by an understanding of neighborhood which in the context of uh, modern India was very powerfully articulated by A.K. Ramanujan in a beautiful essay called Classics Lost and Found. This is about the discovery of the Tamil Sangam classics in the late 19th century. And U.V. Swaminatha Iyer, who is the young Tamil scholar who discovers uh, these texts, so to say, he was advised by uh, an older Tamil scholar who he happened to meet uh, to read some much older texts than he was reading. And Swaminath here didn't think that there were older texts in the language. So he gives him this uh, manuscript and uh, he can't understand what's going on. It's, it's uh, Tamil much older. You know? And then he slowly figures it out and he understands that this is a Jain text called Jivaka Chindamani. You know? And then he tries to find out about this text and no Tamil scholar seems to know much about it. Then there is a Jain community living a few streets away from where he was living. He goes there and there is some celebration happening there and they are distributing sweets and he also gets some sweets and he asks them, Why, what are you celebrating? And they said, we just finished the annual recitation of our sacred text, Jivaka Chintamani. You know? <laughs> so this is a very powerful allegory of neighborhood because it's just a few streets that separate these two things, but two kinds of time are operating there. And you could say that what U.V. Swaminathaya eventually ended up doing was actually to create a map where both these uh, streets could figure, and he produced the first uh, printed edition of Jivaka Chintamani. Yeah. So, so, uh, so what I am interested in is not neighborhood in a kind of easy sense, but neighborhood probably as a principle for differentiating literary spatiality, you know, the spaces where we live in, even when we are at the same time and in the same geographical or uh, seemingly political uh, territory. Like in the, in the case of poetry, this is very striking. And actually, Rizio is here. Rizio knows more about some of these things I'm going to indicate. Like um, literary histories of Malayalam uh, hardly have, like until very recently, they wouldn't have much about um, uh, the corpus of works which were written in uh, varieties of language articulation, like the Arabi Malayalam, for instance which had actually a very rich literary production, at least from the 17th century. And this uh, body of work, especially one of the oldest texts, which is probably the most famous, Muhyiddin Mala, refers to a geography which is uh, uh, links it to Baghdad. Uh, uh, it's about the life, a geographical writing about a Sufi saint. Uh, and uh, the language itself carries traces of these transoceanic uh, connections of uh, uh, the Arab, Arab travels to Kerala and uh, uh, Tamil Nadu coast. Some of the texts, including Mohidin Mala, which is identified as Arabi Malayalam, also figure in the Arabi Tamil corpus. Now, similarly, 
the Christian literary production, again, till the 19th century, till the middle of the 19th century, you do not really get a sense of that in the, in the literary histories that we have. Now, of course, we have accounts which go back and recover some of them, but it is as if the self-understanding of the mainstream Malayalam literary production did not really look at them. And even, you know, till the, at the end of the 19th century, in the case of poetry, this is not really happening. In fact, the coming in of uh, writers from these communities was actually actively resisted uh, in the early decades of the 20th century. Now, in such a situation, how do we pose the question of uh, the world or the larger territories to which one would insert one's location? There, uh, there are two interesting things we need to notice, like Malayalam language is uh, understood as, a, as belonging to the Dravidian family of languages. So uh, uh, morphologically, uh, uh, the grammatical rules, for instance, are very similar to that of Tamil. But at the same time, the vocabulary is uh, uh, majority of Sanskrit derivation. So this is a peculiar thing. Uh, and so even though uh, some of the earliest uh, literary production in Malayalam was in what we see as varieties of Tamil, uh, you will uh, have a much more dominant Sanskrit tradition of or, uh, a tradition of understanding Malayalam in relationship to Sanskrit. So that is the first major index of a cosmopolitan connection which you find in modern Malayalam poetry that Malayalam's larger connections need to be understood in terms of a relationship with the, the Sanskrit world of literary production. So we have like some of the uh, translations which are being made uh, uh, before the 19th century and in the 19th century from Sanskrit. They, are, they just have the title of the book prefixed by the word Pasha, like Pasha Shagundalam. And of course, you have Pasha Kaudiliyam, which is a very, very old text. So uh, regardless of this close connection with Tamil, you have a predominantly uh, Sanskrit related axis along which this larger connections are being conceptualized. Now there are exceptions to this of course. There is a, uh, Tamil, a set of Tamil connections which are explored by uh, some of the poets of a certain kind of religious or spiritual disposition especially from the lower caste from which very famous figures like uh, Sri Narayana Guru actually come later on. Now. Uh, I want to quickly look at one poet who is often seen as the first major modern poet in Malayalam. Now, this is Kumaranashan, who uh, lived, he was born in 1863, he died in a boat accident in 1924. Uh, so Kumaranashan was a lower caste poet who initially had some training in Tamil devotional writing and then he learned Sanskrit uh, under a local Vaidya that is local uh, Ayurvedic doctor, you could say. And uh, then he goes for advanced study to Sanskrit in another place close by, until he meets his spiritual master, Sri Narayana Guru, uh, whose disciple he becomes. Now, Sri Narayana Guru sends him for higher education to Bangalore uh, with a very well-known doctor called Dr. Palpu, who was very active in the lower caste movement. So Ashan probably is one of the first poets to go away from Kerala to have a kind of formative education. Now he goes to Bangalore to study Sanskrit, advanced Sanskrit. Then from there he is, uh, of course there is the plague and then he leaves Bangalore. Uh, then he goes to Calcutta, he is sent to Calcutta to Hindu college and uh, there he uh, again uh, study Sanskrit and he, is, he doesn't complete the degree but he becomes a, a very, very important Sanskrit scholar. This is also the time when he learns English. Uh, he uh, becomes, uh, he reads English texts. A different set of literatures become available to Ashan and you begin to see their traces in his writing. Now it's not a direct trace that you find. It's not like uh, he's adapting, you know, uh, literary works written in English, you know. Although you have some very beautiful translations of short poems by Wordsworth, by Ashan, uh, somewhat later in his life there are writings of that kind. Uh, but what you find is a 
what you can call a different tonality or texture that comes into, into his poetry. Uh, firstly, the kind of geography which used to dominate uh, the Sanskrit derived poetic narrative production in Malayalam uh, begins to change. You do not have any uh, ornamental descriptions of landscape or people. Uh, cities which are described are not spaces of marvel anymore. Instead of that, probably under the influence of Buddhism and Buddhist spiritual discourse, which is very important for Ashan, you get a kind of uh, more ascetic, uh, more minimalizing kind of poetic idiom appearing in Ashan. You know. So, uh, female beauty is not described in terms of physical features. Similarly, uh, as, as I mentioned, landscape or buildings or things of that kind are not objects of marvel. The pleasure is not meant to come from uh, this experience of marvel. Instead of that, uh, you, you know, in fact, uh, one of the last poem I wrote, Karuna, very famous poem, uh, the story of Vasavadatta and Ubagupta, uh, that story itself, of course, it is set in Mathura, Uttara Mathuraburi, but uh, more than uh, the streets of the city, it is actually the graveyard which becomes the central topos of the poem. So, uh, this needs to be understood in terms of a contrast with uh, another dominant idiom of poetry which existed at that time, which is uh, uh, instantiated most powerfully in Ashan's contemporary Vallathol Narayanamenu, a very famous poet who is also renowned uh, as the person who uh, made Kathagali into a globally known art form. So, Vallathol Narayanamenon, often seen as a nationalist poet, he is also writing poems on religious themes, not all on Hindu kind of themes. He has a very famous poem called Magdalena Mariam, which is about Mary Magdalene. Uh, but interestingly, it act, uh, the, the similes, uh, the way in which Jesus is described is in terms of the way you describe Krishna. And uh, often, uh, sometimes Vallathol actually, the poet actually spells it out, like uh, the Jesus sat among these people, like Krishna did, you know, etc., etc. So you get a somewhat different kind of poetic idiom, which, which was to become important in Malayalam. And when the modernists begin writing in the 1950s, they actually tend to differentiate these two poetic idioms. One is a more ascetic one, more minimalist one, and the other is a more ornamental one. And one strand of modernism clearly identified itself with this Ashan kind of strand. Now, very quickly, do, do I have another 10 minutes or something? Yeah. So, uh, uh, the, one of the contexts with... Seven minutes. Seven minutes, that's fine. One of the contexts in which the question of uh, world literature or the world uh, appears in the story is uh, in the context of uh, uh, the poet who was seen as a world poet by Malayalis, that is Rabindranath Tagore. Yeah? Tagore visits Kerala in 1922 as part of fundraising. Today there was some remark on Gandhi's fundraising for Vishwabharati. Yeah? And uh, Ashan writes a poem for that occasion called Divya Kokilam, you know, the divine bird, you know, the divine yeah. coil. Yeah? And uh, in that poem, towards the end, he uh, kind of uh, prays for uh, a long and auspicious poetic career for this great poet let the world resonate with your poetry, resonate with your song. You know. So the word Vishwam becomes important there. Of course, that is also Shlesha Alankara, uh, because Vishwam has two meanings, both for the world as well as Vishwabharati, you know, for, for which uh, he has come to collect funds. Uh, now, uh, Rabindranath Tagore became an occasion for some discussions about uh, uh, new kinds of literature and their uh, translatability or their ability to travel. Uh, one poet who really followed Tagore and translated Gitanjali from Bengali, all the, all the songs into Malayalam, was uh, the very famous poet of uh, 1940s onwards, Ji Shangirakurupa. So Ji Shangirakurupa presents Rabindranath Tagore as a mystical poet. This is one, one of the strands in, within which Tagore's poetry was understood. The word for mysticism that 
critics and poets were using at that time in Malayalam was Yogatmakata. Huh? It's an interesting, strange word. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but this was disputed by a new generation of criticism which becomes important in the, again in the 40s and 50s, like A. Balakrishna Pilla, this very unusual figure about whom Dilip Menon has a very interesting essay uh, called The Local Cosmopolitan. Uh, a. Balakrishna Pilla is somebody who was, who was an autodidact, he was a historian by training, but he was an autodidact in a variety of languages. And so he writes about Proust, you know, very soon after the after Proust begins to get published, in, uh, be before he was translated into English, and articles on Freud, you know, so, uh, and he's the person who tries to introduce a kind of literary, a world literary temporality in terms of which Malayalam literature ought to be understood. So you get arguments about what is progressive among literary movements, you begin to get the introduction of uh, terms like surrealism or futurism, uh, or impressionism or things of that kind. And there, uh, Balakrishna Villa disputes uh, the claims about mysticism and argues that mystical experience, if at all such a thing exists, it is incompatible with literary articulation. So what you have is actually romantic poetry with some symbolist uh, addition. So what, what I'm trying to say is that with this kind of movement in criticism, you begin to get a kind of a disappearance of that poetic significance of Tagore as a world poet in Malayalam. Mm -hmm. Of course, Tagore's influence was not confined to poetry. Uh, his uh, Ghore Bairi, for example, was translated into Malayalam quite early, and it became very important for some of the famous women writers, like Lelidampika Andarjanam. Uh, in fact, uh, she speaks about reading it as a, as a girl, and wanting to write a novel like that. So it had a very, very important influence. But these things are not really part of the mainstream literary history. So after the disappearance of this earlier kind of poetic moment in, in which Tagore and mysticism could be important, you get a different kind of frame within which the world is understood. Balakrishna Pillai is probably a sign of that, but this happened primarily in prose with the progressive writers movement, the social realists, where the world actually has Chekhov and Maupassant and uh, Zola and uh, Proust and Freud and uh, you get a different kind of idea of uh, literary uh, geography in terms of which one defines. And poetry is not immune from this. Poetry continues to be written in meter, but of course the poets are writing about Soviet Union sometimes. Walatul himself wrote a poem called Ah, Stalin, you know, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. so, so th this is also happening. And you find a very important effort to fuse these two strands in the poetry of uh, probably the most popular modern poet in the history of Malayalam literature, that is Changambura Krishnapilla, you know, whose remnants sold I don't know how many editions, you know, in the, in the first years of its uh, uh, publication. So Changambura uh, speaks about reading English short stories and retelling them in the, f I'll find out, no? in the form of poetry, in a very musical poetry. Now, post-independence, this of course we don't have time to speak about, this geography again alters. You begin to get new geographies emerging, especially in relationship to poetry from Africa, poetry from Latin America, etc. In the 1960s and 1970s, this becomes very important. A key figure in that process is, of course, uh, K. Sachidanandan, who is uh, still an important poet, and Ayyapa Panika. But Sachidanandan's poetry, I would like to mention in particular, because Sachidanandan was a very, very important translator of uh, poems of Nerudas and uh, uh, Senghor and Vaiho and all these people. And most, many of these translations were done through English, from English translations, sometimes working with people who knew <coughs> Spanish, you know, or uh, the, the, the language of the original. But through these translations, Sachidanandan also developed a kind of new poetic idiom which he begins to adopt in his original compositions. You know. So you begin to get a kind of new, uh, new kind of free words. It's not about just metricality, but about the grammar of images, so to say, the way in which you arrange images. You begin to get a new poetic idiom which after Sachidanandan has become, or along with Sachidanandan, has become one of the really powerful strands of poetic writing in Malayalam. So there you see a kind of taking in of these connections to different geographies, 
through translation, becoming the original itself. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I will open the floor for questions, sir. Please. Um, thank you for this. Though they say that, like, uh, there are, uh, that, uh, this has been <laughs> kind of often, I see a kind of connection here. Um, since we were talking about, I, I, it's, it's a comment and a question to all the three of us, three of them. Um, I'll start Please. from Uday because uh, you were mentioning Uday that uh, because of this particular kind of criticism, critical tradition which mm -hmm. came in between, which uh, gives as an, uh, as, I know I'm also a Malayali, so, mm -hmm. now gives us a, an understanding of what is yeah. happening in the larger world, right. in the literary world, etc. Uh, from my understanding of uh, Malayalam space, hmm. literary space, uh, there is also a kind of uh, 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 underconfidence hmm. about your own right. Uh, writing. Right. I have always felt that because of your critical uh, hmm. a survey yes. of the world hmm. and constant comparison to, with your own uh, resources. resources and writings. Yes. It always comes under uh, that kind of a scrutiny. Yes. Which, from the critical, it falls into the cynical, yes. you know, yes. at times. Yeah. Right, right. And then suddenly yes. you tend to feel that, you know, our writing is not really matching up to that. Right. You know? Right. Because of this, hmm. because I've, I've translated Ashan, and I've also uh, collected 40 years of Sachidanandan's poetry yes, and yes. introduced it. So I see the, the kind of uh, spectrum of things mm -hmm. which is happening in poetry. So uh, what I feel is because of this kind of a critical thing which is falling into the cynical, you always underestimate your, your space, especially in poetry, mm -hmm. because there, there is a very strong po native poetic strand mm -hmm. which is not really um, uh, which is not really enough you know for us because it always feels that uh, you always feel that you know that type of the, the world class type mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. writing we don't have is to what will yep. uh, what is required yep. you know so you constantly try to this is also one of my critical problems with mm -hmm. Sachi because that because you position uh, this kind of a, project this kind of an image and try to make that kind of poetry uh, what is your native strength uh, is often you know sidelined uh, i'll give an example of this like for instance somebody like balan balajandran julikar who has got this very strong kind of poetic yeah. he stopped writing right you know so what happens is, what I find in Malayalam is that because of this constant aspiration, which is a, which is a mythical kind of aspiration, so it's an illusory thing as far as I am concerned because I think there are native strengths to uh, Malayalam poetry and it has been continuously there. Yes. Uh, so the, the world literature kind of survey, uh, that is really, uh, you know, done some bad. Right. So now my question to the others is that, uh, they are talking about travelogues, you know. So this this is also a kind of travel. When you travel abroad, and you see like different types of people, so there is always that thing of coming back and thinking that okay, our space is not just enough, you know. So you look at this, and you feel that you know it's just not possible for us to reach there. How will you reach? So you you tend to make your space remain that local. You know, it's mm. never really reaching mm. that global which you're projecting. Do you have some comments on this? Thank you. I think we'll take some more questions and then we'll uh, let the speakers answer. Francesca, you had one? Um, well, I wanted to try and make... Uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, try to make Shiferao and Charu's papers talk a little um, uh, to each other. In the sense that, um, I mean, in Charu's... Uh, paper, it was so striking, uh, the particular lenses through which um, uh, you uh, 
the, the writers of the travelogue saw the countries and saw the people in those countries that made them set up, you know, express certain judgments, which seem to be, uh, on the one hand, setting up England for this land of freedom and then going there and, and sort of having a very different, uh, well, freedom seemed to be this big lens through which then you kind of judged everything and everywhere every people you, you, men, you met as either chained or free or freer. Uh, the other seemed to be England versus non-England, uh, where with England you have this kind of political, political view of, uh, of England, whereas, you know, I mean, at a time when Germany or Italy are being also imperialist, you see them as instead kind of uh, kind and, you know, non... Uh, um, non-political. So that seemed to be very striking. And I wonder how much of that was in the travelogue, um, whether the uh, Herui or the other travelogues that you saw, you know, how much a particular lens uh, made, you know, colored very much what you talked about. Um, I was particularly struck by what you said about the um, Herui being a, a chronicler and this dry chronicle style, I mean, that's a slightly separate question, and asking whether that meant that what gets recorded are the bare um, kind of practicalities of travel, that on this day we went there, and on that day we went and then all the other instead reflective moments or reflections are left out, or whether you actually see them coming in the text. And the last point about it, I was really struck by what you said about um, travel experiences going into other kinds of literature. So maybe we go to travel logs and think that that's where we find um, that's where we find the reflection on travel or the reflection or this reflection on the encounters with the world, with other parts of the world. But actually, maybe we don't find them in the travel log. Maybe we find them in a short story that is mm -hmm. set in a different country or a, mm. or the setting of other works. So it was more curiosities rather than... Uh, and actually, I mean, just on, for Uday, just a, a comment, you know, we had a, recently a workshop on translations of um, Eastern poetry into mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. poetry, and, and that's something that came up so very strongly of how a translation is so, cru so such a crucial mm -hmm particular for poets, it seems to be, and how translation then blends or leads to a particular, you know, poetic style, mm -hmm. even when, when you're not translated, but when you're writing your own original poetry. So that, okay. I mean, that seems a very, very key uh, point. Thank you very much. Uh, James, and then, please. Very interesting uh, presentations. Just to build on uh, Francesca's questions, I'm curious, uh, Professor Schiffero, if you could uh, compare this uh, uh, early, early uh, travelogue of Hedois with uh, his uh, later travelogues. Uh, in particular, I'm curious to know if, uh, like the later travelogues, uh, this early one has a, a kind of unique autobiographical or ethnographical component, which I think is one of the most innovative parts, uh, some of the most innovative aspects of the later travelogues. Uh, and my, uh, my second question uh, is, uh, was it uh, as explicitly educational and informative as the other ones, or was it instead more uh, like a chronicle uh, as a uh, new product? So it's sort of a question of genre and method in, in this uh, early unpublished work, which I suppose is the final question. Could you comment on why uh, he chose not to publish uh, this text, if you know anything about that? Thank you. Thank you. There was uh, another question there. Uh, this ascent then is very much there. Thanks, Charu. But uh, you did uh, bring out how women uh, travelogues are so different from the men traveling and writing in the same period, at least in Hindi, some of the ones that I've read. Uh, for example, the things that you notice, right? This is very stereotypical, mm -hmm. but it's true that uh, food and dress, that really comes through. But why they are criti uh, critiquing unfreedom? Right? or freedom in, uh, or, or, or glorifying freedom in uh, wherever uh, in Europe, they are also critiquing perhaps a certain kind of unfreedom here and therefore which builds into uh, a template which was already there perhaps. Because men are also doing the same thing, right? Oh Jagdish, 
when we will become free, like the you know white men, etc. So that template is very much another thing. Uh, photographs, right? Spoke uh, louder than words. So a lot of these people are also uh, at least the magazines are publishing by the 20s and 30s in Chan, for example, Francesca. Uh, so, uh, where you have these images of freedom, especially of women, doing all sorts of things. So, are they also accompanying photographs with these, uh, or these are not serialized at all in magazines, in books, no photographs at all? Uh, yes, please. I would like to supplement what Narika said. Yes, uh, Narika said about this uh, travel of case uh, put by Chitra. Uh, uh, they are the women. They are the women who are presenting uh, the uh, travel law while uh, while highlighting freedom issue. But I would like to uh, give you a case of a person just to supplement what he said. It, a, a, a sadhu from Valia, a saint. His name was Prabodhanand. In 1923, he wrote a booklet, "London ki meme kaise rehti hai." It's about meme of London. So, uh, I don't know where he has visited there or not, but maybe it's good to compare. And he also says in that, ki, yeah, uh, they live uh, with the freedom, and here our uh, women uh, have no that kind of freedom. And this person not only wrote this kind of booklet, he also uh, wrote various booklets on melas. Brahmapur ka mela, on a small, small mela on which we don't even talk today. Uh, he wrote in English, no, not in Hindi. And he also translated many English track, uh, text, philosophical text in Hindi uh, during 1922-1923. So sometimes I feel that that time we were uh, multilingual, now we are becoming more monolingual, monolingual because that time this kind of translation and, and, and writing about other experiences, the sadhu wrote about London ki vem kaise rehti hai, that means something. And, 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 and I think maybe it's good to compare uh, see the, the so typical, uh, the stereotypes or the narrative types and what's difference you find in your narratives uh, and the narratives of this kind of booklets. Thank you. We'll take the last question and then we'll let the speakers answer. Uh, Wardirun? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I have uh, two questions to Shifra. Uh, first one you say at the beginning that uh, the main source of inspiration for uh, Sagurgis and uh, Afotke Gabresus was from Italian uh, uh, tradition. Just if you have any evidence of specific sources which have influenced this uh, travel writing. And the second question is you mentioned this uh, travel, uh, this uh, uh, report of Ruivo uh, de Silas travel to, I mean, to the delegation travel to Japan. If you can elaborate more on this, because I think it's a kind of turning point in, uh, in Ethiopian history. In I mean, political history in the sense of uh, a, a travel experience which uh, brings back a heavy and important source of inspiration as a political model, societal model, which could be an alternative to the West. So that is, I think, a unique idea, uh, which may be very interesting. And I have a very quick question to uh, the previous pre presenter, Cheru, which I found very interesting presentation. Uh, I was just curious to understand better if you could trace any source of specific literary influence on those women writing from other authors, either uh, in India or in Europe or other countries, if there is any. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start from uh, Shiparao and then Charu and then Udaya for the answers, okay. Uh, <coughs> Madam Chairwoman, I would be a little low because I have a set of questions respond to. Uh, the first is Francesca's uh, question. The lens through which Herue and the others saw the Western world. Uh, now, you see, uh, it's, uh, I have thought a great deal about this. The, and then there is uh, James here, Sarah, who can also help. The, there is a fascination of the West when they started out. Its fascination is not for its democracy or freedom, not at all. It is more for its uh, technological achievement, which they called, uh, for which they use the word civilization, the Amharic version of uh, civilization. So they always wanted to see this, uh, this, this civilization. 
to appreciate it very closely. Uh, but then there is also this, uh, uh, this fear, uh, this, uh, this view that the West is dangerous. You know, they will come and conquer us. They will have to keep them at, at a distance. They will destroy our culture, our religion. Uh, that kind of view. Uh, so when they went there, uh, they, uh, in the descriptions, technology uh, gets good space, uh, description of technology. But also, in spite of their view, what comes out very strongly is an impression about institutions. The British Parliament, particularly the House of Lords, impressed very much, uh, you know, uh, an entire delegation. The way the police are, are organized, the way the army is organized, the way they uh, organize ceremonies, for instance, the way they line up their people for certain projects. Uh, so, in other words, the state was very, very attractive. They wanted to see the state and copy as much as they can uh, the organization of the, space, the state. So the state uh, gets a lot of uh, space. Uh, the descriptions are very, yes, they are very dry, yes, they are dry, but from time to time, uh, juicy stories come up. For instance, in this new book, while Hiroi and so on were there, there was a demonstration by the suffragist, suffragist movement. And they just could not believe that women could get all this right and could come out and demand this much. I mean, it's the world turned upside down. You know, they were uh, terribly shocked. So that kind of... Uh, uh, think uh, comes out uh, all the way through, you know, as you go along. Uh, you, uh, what's very important also, which has not been seen together, uh, together, are the properly literature, literary works, and the travelogues, the creative literature and the travelogues. In the creative literature, they don't usually put the setting in Europe. They, the character usually comes back from Europe and brings in a lot of his experience and uses it to compare and contrast, um, to critique his society, to change, uh, to advocate reforms and so on. This is the way it's presented. But when he comes back, the West is uh, described as a character sees it, which is very often autobiographical in the, for, in the author's own uh, experience. Sometimes, of course, you have authors who have not been abroad but who uh, uh, portray these kinds of characters. Uh, when I come to uh, to uh, James's uh, question, uh, autobiographical innovation. Yes, as uh, time passed and as he accumulated experience, the travelogues become uh, more elaborate, more descriptive. Uh, you could see more confidence. Photographs going into it. So, in this one, it's more like log. But even then, you know, from time to time, you have uh, you have this kind of juicy uh, stories. Uh, we can always argue about the genre, but uh, the chronicle aspect is incredibly striking. You know, writing the time of the day, where they went, and what they did, and particularly the offshoot things, you know, are the, are very important and uh, <coughs> they are recorded. Why did he not publish it? Uh, we are not sure, but then there is a difference because the leader of the delegation, <coughs> the very high Lord Raskasa uh, and Hurui were uh, very close to each other. Nevertheless, you know, the draft uh, on the draft we see that there are some serious differences between the two, even in terms of authorship, because Kasa would have liked it to be a whole <coughs> according to the draft. You know, here and there there are indications. So perhaps the two of them did not agree about you know delicate things like like authorship or the way some some paragraphs are uh, are uh, framed now my argument is uh, in the past when a king went out within his team there is always a chronicler here as well the big lord when he went out he made sure that there was someone to write this down that's why Rui was a then Afor was selected. Kabbadah Mikhail was later selected by, by Emperor Al-Sanasi. And so it was a mission, a duty for him. Uh, but then Kasa took that literally and 
correctly and wanted it to be to be like a co-authorship and they, there, could, there could be a difference. Nevertheless, we are not sure. Uh, 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 when the rule asked me, uh, the Italian tradition, why did you say the Italian tradition? Uh, it is because uh, this professor, who was a professor of uh, Ceruli and so on, uh, the name was skipped my mind, who, who recruited them. No, not Gallina. Really. Gallina. Professor Gallina recruited, recruited both Fasagorgis uh, and Afo to be his assistants in Naples. And then he asked them to write. So both of them wrote two texts at least to be used for teaching purposes. And uh, exactly his uh, instructions are not uh, recorded for us, but from bits and pieces we know that he wanted them to write. And the students should get the prose, the formal prose, as well as like uh, you know colloquial prose, so they used their own uh, their own their own uh, discretion to write in two different ways. Otherwise, there was a lot of pressure on both writers from Gallina to write, and later he got the books published. Uh, that's why I say it is uh, the the inspiration comes actually from uh, Gallina, who, who wanted to use these things for teaching purposes. The novel that, uh, the so-called novel that Afor wrote was very much appreciated by Galina and then other uh, professors because it gave uh, elegant prose and then some amount of colloquial prose which was very good for, for the teaching as well as lots of uh, vocabulary which again I found useful. Uh, 